is Johan Payan. He's visiting us from Grenoble. I think I've said that nearly correctly. My French Grenoble. apologies. Grenoble. Grenoble. <laughs> it's, it's really tough. And I'm going to have a go at pronouncing the, uh, the laboratory where Johan is a deputy director as well. So it's the Technique de l'Ingénieur uh, Médica Médical <laughs> de la Complexité Informatique Mathematique et Applications. Applications. <laughs> that's really. Renault. <laughs> so that's T I M C I M A for short, which stands for techniques. In case you, you know, you had trouble with my French accent, uh, which I'd be surprised if you did. But it's techniques for biomedical engineering compl and complexity management, uh, informatics, mathematics, and applications in Grenoble. <laughs> So uh, there, uh, Johan is the deputy director of this laboratory. It's got about 300 people in this laboratory. So, and they have a lot of uh, similar interests in this lab to the ABI. It's about the same sort of size. Uh, within that laboratory, there are a number of groups, and Johan is the, uh, the director of one of those groups of about 50-odd people, which is the computer-assisted medical interventions group. And his research interests are very broad reaching. I met Johan a few years ago, a number of years ago, at the CNBBE conferences, I think. And broad reaching interests, including biomechanics, computer assisted surgery, pressure ulcer prevention, uh, speech production, and perceptive supplementation. So, we're going to hear a little bit about some of these areas during the talk today. Thank you, Johan. Thanks, Martin, for providing me uh, the opportunity to be here today. So, actually, you did all the introduction, so I can skip. Uh, skip uh, most of my first slide, thanks for that. Uh, so the lab, as Martin said, is uh, located in uh, Grenoble, south uh, east of France. So just in the middle of the French Alps and uh, close just in front of Grenoble hospitals. Uh, it's, uh, so he said it's a lab of about 300 people. So with a research team, uh, some of them, uh, I need some glasses, it's not so clear for me. <laughs> uh, some of them are more uh, dedicating on, uh, on IT and other one on health science. And my team is mainly dedicated on computer assisted medical intervention. So I won't go into the detail of, of this point, but just to, uh, to let you know that the idea is to try to provide some tools to the clinician to, to help him uh, before or during surgery. And this team was created uh, uh, more than 20 years uh, ago. And it, it gathers uh, something like 50 people. Uh, we are a dozen of, uh, of, of permanent people. And, and the other important point is that we also have affiliated to the team some, uh, some clinicians who are, have just to cross the road to, to come to the lab from different uh, clinical uh, departments uh, that you can, uh, you can see here. So the, the idea of, of this team is, is uh, more general than what I'm going to focus today. Today, I will mainly focus on biomechanics for computer assisted <coughs> medical intervention, uh, since uh, we mainly interact with Martin and Paul in that sense. Uh, but the main idea of the team, I mean, the main target is, is this, is try to provide some tools for surgeon during surgery, uh, and, and mostly common as, as uh, medical robotics, but it's larger than that. And, and to design this kind of tool, we need to also to better perceive the reality of the patient. So to propose some new sensors and new imaging modality to try to better perceive the pathology. But also to, and I will focus on that, to try to provide some uh, what we call reasoning along the, this loop of action, perception, action. Uh, how to provide some specific model, models of the patient trying to work on a virtual uh, representation of the patient. Uh, so that uh, we can propose the surgeon to help him to plan his surgery and eventually to modify this planning according to what the model predicts uh, accordingly. So this, is, uh, this involves, uh, I will talk about some, some biomechanical modeling, but this involves also any kind of modeling, statistical, uh, and of course a bunch of image uh, modalities in terms of image uh, processing. The other specificity of our team is that we are, of course, as I said, close to, to medicine, since I told you uh, the target is, is of course, is a, is a medical one. But we also have a strong uh, connection with industry because we, that's a choice in our team uh, that has some constraint, of course. We really want what we develop in the team to be transferred to, into the clinical routine. And that means that we need to interact with industries or, in, in most of the cases, create company that are going to, to propose and to sell uh, the, the corresponding medical uh, devices. So this is the reason why, since uh, uh, about 20 years, 
uh, our team was at the origin of the creation of 15 uh, 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 spin-off company. Uh, so you have, you have the name of those company around the team, uh, uh, each with the idea that each startup company is, is, is focuses on a given uh, a clinical application. Uh, on urology, orthopedy, or different kind of application, and I will uh, show you an uh, example uh, on pressure cell prevention with one of these uh, uh, startup companies uh, very soon. So, um, uh, just, to, just to be short, sorry for those of whom uh, here who know the, the, the idea the, of what we, we can imagine in terms of, of medical robotics. This work was done in the team uh, more than 20 years ago in the case of, of spine surgery and more specifically in the case of uh, the pathology of scoliosis in which the surgeon had to realign the spine and, and for, for doing that he has to put uh, uh, those bars and to put uh, screws into the vertebra with a kind of delicate gesture because he only has a partial vision, vision of the of the back of, of the body. So what we did at that time was, uh, now it's, it's common, it's current, it was uh, quite simple. The idea was that from 3D imaging, uh, we were able to propose a reconstruction of the vertebra and to propose the, the surgeon the optimal trajectory for the, each screw so that we can guide him. And, and this is, uh, this guiding can be uh, done by local, localizing the uh, tool, surgical tool during surgery. Uh, and, and by uh, thanks to a 3D optical camera, by by uh, local uh, by triangulation, be able to uh, know the actual orientation of the tool and to get the surgeon uh, for for this uh, screwing uh, gesture. So you see, the first patient was uh, treated in Grenoble uh, more than uh, 20 years ago, uh, and and we now since that date face another problem that is still not solved uh, about. Most of the uh, organs of, of the of the of the uh, of the human tissues, uh, which are soft, uh, um, you have here a kind of uh, example of a representation of a, um, online uh, measurement of the abdominal uh, cavity uh, during a briefing. Uh, imagine that uh, we want to guide in the same way we want to, for example, to guide the, the surgeon to, to do a biopsy gesture in in the suspected uh, zone of the of the liver. Here, the problem is much more complicated because we have to compensate for the breathing displacement, but also we have to compensate for the deformation of the, of the soft tissues and the soft organs to be able to guide him uh, toward the, the original uh, suspected uh, uh, zone. And, and this is still not solved. I mean, today we still do not have been able to propose an industrial product that is sold to surgeons to do such a gesture because we still have uh, many. Uh, question to solve. Uh, to do that, of course, it's classical for you. We need, to, if we take this example of the, of the liver, we need to, to, to design a patient-specific finite element, I mean, biomechanical model of the liver to simulate the way this liver is going to deform under the activation of the insertion of the needle inside the liver. So it's classical image segmentation model, uh, 3D volume construction, and then simulation through, in that case, finite element uh, modeling that uh, will help us to see how the liver is going to deform once the, the needle is going to enter, uh, uh, to, uh, to go inter internally to this uh, liver. Uh, and again, today we are not able to provide a solution because we still face a, a set of, of, of questions uh, that, are, uh, that has to be solved before providing such a product. First of all, uh, as you probably know, uh, surgeons have almost no time. So, uh, of course, uh, as biomechanician, it's classical for us to spend uh, days, weeks, or even months building a nice, very nice uh, model we are proud of. But clinicians want model uh, every day, I mean, ev for every patient. So we need to solve this question of patient-specific biomechanical model of the, of the organ. And, and I know that uh, this is also uh, a, a strong is issue here, and, and, and people are working uh, here a lot on this question. We need also uh, to be able to estimate the patient-specific constitutive behavior of an organ because from uh, the liver of a French a guy who drinks a lot of alcohol and the liver of, uh, we saw yesterday in the museum, the statistics, uh, th there is a, a nice exhibition uh, on, on the world virtual uh, downtown in the city and they, at the end of the exhibition on human body, they tell us the quantity of alcohol uh, people drink among countries and, and France is one of the highest. So the liver of a French guy is not the same, probably not the same as the liver of, a, of someone from New Zealand. So. Of course, the mechanical behavior will change. And again, uh, other question which is still complicated, especially in the case of highly nonlinear complex model, 
Uh, we need to enable, in, uh, in order to be able to guide the surgeon, we need to be able to run such kind of model in real time, at least in interactive time, which is still a complicated model, a question, sorry, when we think in terms of highly uh, nonlinear, upper elastic uh, biomechanical model, for example. So uh, that are the main constraints uh, of, of we have to face. And today I wanted to focus on mainly, uh, I would say, two applications. Uh, one is uh, quite old, uh, was addressed uh, more than 15 years ago, but I think it's a good example of the philosophy we want to, see, we, we saw at that time the things. Uh, another one is much more uh, recent. Just before going there, a short overview of what is done in my, in my team in terms of, 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 uh, of biomechanics for computer assisted medical intervention. As I told you, uh, we mainly address different kind of, of uh, 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 pathology in different kind of clinical departments. And each, each of these one, we uh, of course can design some robotic tools, but all, we also design some uh, biomechanical model. As I told you, this will be the main focus of my talk today. So for example, uh, this is quite classical. We know that we can use uh, finite element modeling of the, the way bones are going uh, to deform under the, after the, the pose of prosthesis, for example. This can be used uh, in terms of computation for uh, assisting uh, some kind of orthopedic uh, surgery. We also are working on the modeling of, of brain uh, soft tissues. Uh, to uh, try to compensate for what is called brain shift, actually, when uh, for brain tumor, when you open, when the surgeon opens the skull, uh, you have a shift of the, of the brain tissue due to many reasons. Uh, and, and of course, the, the, the tumor that was specifically localized before surgery, uh, is, is, is then the position of this tumor is going to be affected by, by, by this shift. So the idea of building such a model is to compensate for the deformation and to continue to guide the surgeon toward the target. Uh, you probably, uh, most of you had a, a presentation from Anna Mira, who was visiting uh, uh, Martin's lab uh, during last month uh, on breast modeling for the modeling of, of uh, uh, breast compression, compression uh, for mammography. And again, uh, a biomechanical model of the breast tissue had to be designed there. Uh, I will come back to the face modeling we did uh, in that uh, framework. Uh, as Martin said, we also worked on speech production and on tongue mo uh, modeling, but I didn't mention it here. And I will finish my talk by the example of, of modeling of uh, uh, after breast, uh, buttock soft tissues, uh, for uh, pressure ulcer prevention, and also foot modeling, be because we also have a foot uh, pressure ulcer, uh, for especially for diabetic patients, uh, in the case of foot uh, modeling uh, we did in the lab. So that's uh, the, an overview. So uh, let me start with uh, computer assisted maxillofacial surgery. Again, this work was started in the lab, lab almost 20 years ago. So it's a kind of old word, but uh, I, I, I take this as an example because for me it's a good uh, example of, of what uh, can be done and what should not be done. Uh, so just uh, we address here what we call orthognatic surgery, so which means at which aims at trying to realign. Uh, the teeth uh, for those kind of pathology uh, in terms of teeth occlusion, in terms of aesthetic, and in terms of functionality. For example, this patient was just unable to close his uh, lips. So in that case, a surgical gesture consists in cutting uh, the uh, lower uh, and, and sometimes upper uh, maxilla and to reposition them. That's the idea. Uh, so if I come back to this patient, uh, what was actually uh, originally planned by the surgeon was uh, this kind of gesture with a, uh, a, a cutting and a displacement of the upper maxilla, same for the mandible and also for the chin. And then when the clinician, clinician came to us, this was to address this question. Okay, we, we know what we pl have planned, but what, uh, what's about the consequence in terms of patient aesthetic after surgery? Well, what is he going to look uh, like, he or she is going to look like, and what will be the functional consequence of, of this, I mean, in terms of fashion mimics. And for example, this patient will be able, will he be still able to close, uh, uh, will he be able to close his lips or not? So to do that, classical, we need to model in a preoperative context, soft tissue be over the face, and then nice because it's a nightmare from, from a modeling point of view. You have, of course, the skin, but also many underlying tissues, uh, layers with, with many muscles. Uh, and uh, if we look at what was done at the literature, to me, uh, what I said, 
that should not be done in that way, that many people provided face modeling, but each of those models took uh, not weeks, sometimes mon months to be, to be built, with some of them using voxel as a finite element, so requiring a month of co or weeks of computation. So it's nice tools, nice for publication, but useless to my point of view for, for clinicians. At least to my, to my uh, knowledge, there is still no industrial product that proposes such kind of model for, for application because I told you we need to provide something fast in terms of patient-specific modeling. So we need to, uh, to decrease our, our, our level of exigence to, to some point of view. So what we proposed at that date is quite old. It was published in the Journal of Biomechanics almost 20 years ago. We published this notion of mesh matching algorithm. With this idea, simple idea, we also, uh, uh, more recently, people call it uh, uh, atlas-based uh, uh, or template-based uh, method. The idea of someone somewhere has already taken uh, months or years in, in, in manually defining a model that we call generic uh, model in that case. So this is one uh, very old version of the face model. We have a more recent one. Uh, uh, so by hand, you can, you can uh, focus on a kind of symmetric face, uh, put more elements in regions that are highly deformed, dis decide to, to put uh, different layers for the, with different constitutive equations. All this uh, classical work of uh, biomechanicians. This was the idea. Uh, of this model, uh, and, and in that case, we also designed the mesh so that, so that the muscle can be identified with uh, autotropic uh, behavior of those, of those fibers. And then uh, uh, you can put in this model uh, any kind of, of, of muscle activation you want. And, and the following idea was that then uh, to do automatic uh, uh, morphing, so based on segmentation or now based on 3D image uh, registration, uh, with the idea of that, of that this generic <coughs> mesh is going to be morphed onto the new geometry of a new patient. And, and this will be done automatically. That's the idea that was uh, published at, at that time. Uh, of course, with this patient, uh, the, the, the uh, generic uh, face mesh has nothing to do, but it is still a mesh, so it's possible to, to do uh, this kind of registration automatically and, and so that it fits uh, the, the, the face uh, of the subject, but you also uh, uh, maintain its topology in terms of muscular posi positioning. So this was done uh, for the skull also. Uh, so it allows you to have this kind of, of model and, and now in terms of modeling you, you can decide that this kind of displacement you can input the displacement as a condition to the model. Before this you need to provide some constitutive equations. Uh, I won't go into the details but the idea we tried different kinds. This was an individual experiment of, of, on a face uh, fresh cadaver, fresh uh, face uh, uh, um, uh, specimen. So you can just do some indentation or, or extension test and, and, get, and try, try to get the nonlinearity. Try with inverse model to, for example, in that case, fit a EO strain energy model and then put the values we get into the model. I won't go into the detail, but that's a way to do. But in that case, things stay generic. I mean, only one, uh, the same constitutive uh, laws for all the patient, which we know is not the case. So uh, we try to go further on that. Uh, we try to use, uh, to do in vivo <coughs> notation, but we forgot about that. I, I can explain later, but it was more too complicated. And then we focus on a kind of a simple local measurement through what we call aspiration. So instead of pushing the tissue, we just uh, suck the, the tissues. It's easier, it works better. So we designed some, uh, and again, through inverse analysis, we were able to do uh, on a patient, uh, no, sorry, on, on a volunteer, some, uh, some measurement on different parts of the face uh, and to, uh, to try to estimate as a global measure, again, it's very uh, global, it's, uh, it's local, but it just doesn't uh, fit all the data to see uh, some of the difference between uh, uh, different part of, of, the, of the face in terms of constitutive and, and assuming that this could be patient specific. We could imagine doing that on each new patient. So, and then uh, at, this step, at this step, with those kind of constitutive law, we can uh, then try to uh, uh, activate and see what would be the, the, the consequence, uh, the, uh, the planned consequence of the surgery. I don't know if you, if you got the yeah, simulation. Okay, so then, then uh, we can uh, see what uh, what what is planned by the model, and actually compare the 
prediction of the model with the actual uh, outcome of surgery. So this can be done in parallel, what we call the retrospective study. And we, then we can uh, try to quantify the difference in terms of prediction and what, what was the actual uh, outcome of surgery. And we could imagine this kind of tool used before surgery by the surgeon just to eventually show the consequence to the patient and eventually modify his uh, strategy in terms of bone repositioning. Okay, uh, so we published uh, in Medical Image Analysis Journal uh, some years ago the, uh, the way we, the robustness of the method, the way we could fit any kind of morphology in an automatic way with this f fact that, as I told you, this has to be automatic to be, uh, to be efficient. Okay, so uh, this, this, this was quite all the work. I will fo now focus on a, a, a more recent one. Again, coming back to, to my question um, about constraints. As I told you, constraint of time to generate a model, how to, to estimate the constitutive behavior, and how to run model in real time. I, I, will, I will now try to address this last question uh, in the context of pressure <coughs> prevention. So I don't know if you are familiar with pressure cell prevention, but the idea is that uh, because of high, too high pressure, uh, the, the, the skin can damage, the soft tissue can damage, and then you can uh, have uh, an injury that can be uh, at the surface, but that can be also inside the, uh, the soft tissue and with huge consequence. You have to know that 10% of the patient, whatever the patient that come into the hospital, leaves the hospital with a pressure cell. So it's huge. Okay, uh, because of many reasons, I have no time to explain, but that's one main source of pressure ulcer. The other uh, main source of pressure ulcer is due to diabetic. As you know, diabetic is, uh, is huge. And you have in the world one uh, foot that is cut every 20 seconds uh, because of diabetics and because of, of pressure ulcer. So that's huge, you have to imagine that. Uh, because we are not able to prevent that, to, to, to say to the people, oh, be careful, you, are, you, you have a risk of, of injury on your foot, stop walking, stop doing that, uh, look at your foot. Uh, same for, for people who are sitting on a wheelchair without any uh, uh, perception on, on the, on the buttock era, 20% of the paraplegic of the person will get a pressure ulcer during their life. So uh, with those high numbers, uh, we start to work in the lab in how to try to prevent them, them by, by modeling the way the interaction between pressure and, and uh, tissue uh, injuries. So uh, to do that, I need to explain uh, what is the main cause of pressure ulcer. We have mainly two main causes. The first one is, is well known. It's, it's, called, it's called ischemia. It's because of the pressure. Uh, the, the, the blood, the, the blood vessels are closed and then the, the oxygen doesn't come to the tissue. And after two to four hours, the cells can, can die, okay? Uh, but there is another much short-term uh, effect, which is only purely deformation. Because of too high strength, just the cells doesn't support too high strength and just uh, die because of that. Uh, and this is very uh, complicated because this starts, uh, so you have the scheme of the tissues with the external skin and the bone. Uh, due to this compression, the, the injury starts inside at this interface. Uh, and it takes some hours or one day or two days to be seen at the surface. So usually surgeons say, okay, I, I had a patient during eight hours during surgery. He left my department. No, no, there's no, no pressure ulcer. And after two days when coming back home, he got a pressure ulcer. Uh, this is, uh, the difficulty of this is that it's very transversal to any clinical department and there is no uh, specific uh, uh, attention to this prevention. And this is huge as I, as I as showed the numbers uh, just showed you. Uh, and then if we try to look more in details and coming back to this scheme of, uh, of a bone pressure, <coughs> put in pressure of soft tissue with different layers, you can imagine skins or hypodermic layer or muscles. Uh, due to the difference in stiffness uh, of those layers, you will have uh, an isotrope, uh, uh, different ways of pressuring the tissues. Some of them being much with a higher, much higher uh, strength than others. Uh, so remember those two levels of strength. If you have something like 20% of deformation of strength, it's a, it's a risk of ischemia, of, of, of loss of, of, of oxygen in the tissues. But if you reach 50% of the deformation, then you have a mechanical risk of, of cell rupture uh, and death of the, of the cell. This is shown here by, uh, uh, by many of the, the 
different people, but mainly a work from uh, uh, my colleagues uh, Keith Romans and Amit Geffen uh, in Netherlands uh, and Tel Aviv University, showing that uh, assuming a normal pressure, if you have uh, no, uh, I mean, very low internal strain, no risk. If you have strain between 20 and, and 50 percent, of the order of 50 percent, then what, exactly what I call UA schema, like oxygenation, and then in two to four hours, you can have a deep tissue injury. But which, is, which was discovered quite recently that for higher strains, uh, the damage, the consequence are membrane damages, physiological mechanisms, and that can link to the rupture of the cytoskeleton around the, uh, the, 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 in the cell and with a, a lack of, of permeability, of, with a, of impermeability of, 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 the, of, of the membrane. And, and in a very short period of time, between five and 10 minutes, or maybe probably lower than that, you can get a pressure rupture. So you, you can imagine the high risk of, of some people. And the idea is to be able to track this and to absolutely avoid this. And this is the work. But the problem is that we do not have any uh, what we call biomarker. We have no way, at least at the moment, maybe this should be invented. So I'm looking at uh, people who, uh, who invent a new, new sensor. We have no way to in vivo measure in real time the way tissue, uh, uh, the way uh, we can measure strain, internal strain to tissue. We have no biomarker, for example, at the buttock area on, on, the, on the cushion of, of a paraplegic people. So uh, no solution at that way. And, and hopefully there is a solution, which is a numerical one, uh, which is uh, the one I'm going to present. First of all, of course, we need to measure. We need to know the pressure at the buttock seat uh, interface or around the foot, for example. Uh, let's go back to the, to the paraplegic example. So we need to embed, uh, that was the objective of the project, to embed on the wheelchair measurement and um, uh, measurement of the pressure. So when we look at that, at, when we started this project 10 years ago, uh, there was at that time many free uh, companies, and there is still today only three companies, selling uh, classical, actually, uh, pressure sensors, but very expensive, about fifteen thousand uh, uh, dollars, uh, euros. Sorry, not dollars. Uh, each uh, so uh, ca patient cannot afford that. Only re-education center uh, and the other point, those those devices were uh, directly connected to a computer, so it, it was not embedded devices. So uh, our idea was to propose something that could be sold to directly to the patient. So we have uh, patented and designed. Uh, actually, uh, the, this new uh, product, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, something that is 100% textile, so that's uh, uh, the, the, the fibers, the, some of them are coated with a dedica dedicated material so that they, they can conduct current and they can, they can have a piezo-resistive effect so that we can measure the pressure thanks to this very simple uh, textile with the idea of putting the, the, the textile all around the cushion and having a, an embedded uh, a measurement of the pressure. So this is uh, now, uh, those days, uh, sold by the Texas company, which is one of the startups I, I, I mentioned earlier in my talk. So once we are able to measure the pressure uh, at this interface, then you have to know another problem, uh, many problems in, the, in that research project, is that you can have two patients with exactly the same pressure map but one is going to have no problem, and the other one is going to uh, get a pressure ulcer. Why? Because of difference in terms of anatomy. You can imagine that. Uh, because of, of from one patient to the other one, you can have, have different uh, stiffness in terms of fat tissue, muscle, skin, and so on. Many uh, specificity of each, uh, each subject. So we need to take this into account. Uh, and this is uh, the way uh, we uh, propose to address this question. Uh, to build a, a patient-specific model of the, of the buttock area soft tissue of, of, this, uh, of this subject and to use this model in real time to compute the internal strains. So we, we propose to, to some extent, to have a numerical biomarker of, of, the, of the internal strains since we do not have any other kind of, of, of biomarker, uh, as I told you before. So uh, this model uh, was done in that sense. Uh, we implement uh, 
uh, into an open platform artisan uh, finite element platform, uh, um, an hyper elastic model. We start with a very simple uh, neo can material. We are currently moving towards the GANS material. Uh, with uh, from the imaging modalities, uh, modeling uh, at this moment in a simple way, uh, uh, only one layer for the skin, so we pull uh, some, uh, some fat and some, uh, some muscles. Uh, with the idea of using uh, this model in real time, uh, uh, with the objective to compute from, for, from a given pressure, to compute the internal strain and to m see whether some region have higher strain than 50%. That's the idea. Uh, the problem we had with this scan when we tried to work on that is that uh, this such kind of model requires some hours to compute, as you can imagine, because it's a nonlinear upper uh, elastic one. So we, uh, to, to, to provide something that could be real time, we have explored, uh, thanks to the um, uh, things proposed in ANSYS, we have proposed to uh, explore the reduced order modeling of, the, of, this, uh, of this computation. Uh, I think I won't go into the details of, of this, but I, we can come back later with the idea of, of uh, reducing the way we can make the correspondence between a given pressure issue and, and the deformation of the, of the tissues to make uh, this model run uh, uh, in, uh, in real time. So uh, here are the error that can be uh, uh, less than 1% between the, the full model and the reduced one if we, we have a sufficient high order uh, of modes used. Um, then assuming that we are in real time, it's quite simple, able to detect the position of the, of, of, of the main body preeminence, the ischion here. Uh, so by simple image processing, uh, position the, the pressure map onto the model. We can get, uh, as, as, as uh, you will see here, uh, sorry, I will come back. Okay. Okay, so this is an example. So this is a pressure map, so there is a, there is a wireless connection with a laptop uh, that is not shown here. And on the laptop, we have the model, the pre-compute reduced order model. So you will see with a short delay, it's not real time, but you will see here the pressure map and directly uh, the, the computation by the model's deformation. So for here is moving on the right. So you will see the, the, the high pressure and the corresponding deformation of the model with some delays. Uh, and here in color, you, you see the the strain cluster, I mean, the, the values of the strain that are below are, are higher than 20 or 50%. Then he's moved on the left, and you see, uh, again, with some delay, uh, because it's, it's not completely real time, you see the, the, the deformation of the model and, and the compute uh, uh, strains, the values uh, below the, the tuberculosis uh, uh, preeminence. So you can imagine uh, having that running uh, in real time. Uh, as you probably know, uh, paraplegic person or even tetraplegic don't move like, like, like that. They are mostly do not move. So, uh, and the risk are, is uh, that they, they stay immobile for a too long period. So we have this idea of trying to go further with this kind of, of, of thing. This is all what I will uh, say about uh, paraplegic people. I, I, I'd like to go now to, to, to end with a last example, which is a, a same kind of pressure itself, but in the case of diabetic foot, which is much uh, Larger, larger in terms of consequences, as I uh, told you, in terms of numbers of uh, foot uh, cut uh, in the world. Uh, so again, sorry for the for the for the pictures. Uh, this kind of pressure ulcer uh, starts uh, with this kind of figure. Uh, I didn't uh, mention for paraplegic; it's obvious they have no feeling uh, at, the, at the lower part of the body. Same for diabetic because of the, of the disease. Uh, you have two pathology. Uh, one is angioplasty, uh, with angiopathy, sorry, so which means that uh, you have uh, vessels that are much uh, fragile. And another is neuropathy, which means that uh, some of the diabetic people do not feel um, uh, the, the, the pressure outside their food, or at least partially feel them. Which is why if they have a high interaction, they have something in the shoe, or, or repeated uh, micro trauma, they don't, just don't feel it and they can get uh, this kind of, of pressure ulcer. So the same idea was to try to prevent that with the same uh, philosophy. Uh, uh, because if you want to lo look at the, the number, uh, here are more details, uh, number of, of people suffering, uh, you see 15% of those people uh, will develop at least one pressure, and 15% of them 
will need amputation, which, which uh, gives this number of 20, 20 cut every, uh, sorry, one foot a cut every 20 seconds. So again, when we start this project, we look at, okay, what exists in terms of trying to measure the pressure, because again, the origin of these uh, injuries, of these injuries are too much, too high pressure. And then almost uh, nothing, we'll see. The only prevention was, okay, just, if you know people from, who suffer from diabetes, just look every day at their foot, and if there is any rednecks, stop, go to the, see the doctor, sometimes use orthotics, uh, and yes, as I told you, if red skin, just have a rest. But nothing in terms of measurement. The only product that existed when we started the project was those ones, some lab products. The only, it's funny to see that the only products was used for, for, for sports, actually. So uh, people put money just to, to count the number of foot rather than just to measure the actual pressure below the, the foot, which is uh, surprising to me. So uh, again, uh, we, we have the same uh, philosophy of using our textile, um, uh, or design new textile to uh, actually uh, to uh, knit uh, um, uh, socks. So this is uh, the kind of socks we are doing with Texasense. So this is done in a, in a classical uh, knitting machine. So it's, uh, it costs almost nothing because it's fiber, as you know, probably fiber is nothing. Uh, some of the fibers I told you uh, are able to conduct currents. We have a microprocessor there, you, you can see it, but we will see it later. And some other uh, fibers are, have a piezo-resistive effect. We can put uh, uh, fibers whenever we want on the, on, on the two uh, two's upper surface or below the, below the foot. Uh, um, and then, uh, um, again, okay. Then you have here a video. So you can see the circuit that collects the data and send in by Bluetooth on, on, on the computer. You can see below the pressure measure uh, below each of the, of the sensors. So here we put some sensor on, uh, onto the metatast hell and, and, and below the hill, which are the main region uh, affected by uh, pressure. Also. So this is a way to measure in an embedded way the pressure. And again, it's not sufficient. As the same for the attack, we need to have a patient specific uh, model. So again, uh, coming back to the foot, in that case, much more complicated than the, than the buttocks tissues uh, because the foot has, uh, has many bone structures put in contact. There is no, no uh, ideal joint, it's just contact between bony structure, uh, many, many uh, uh, hundreds of ligaments, many muscles, uh, and, uh, and with this passive rigidification of the foot due to its uh, complex anatomical structure. So it took us uh, almost uh, six years <laughs> To, uh, to build and to validate a full model. It's, it was huge, uh, uh, probably the most complicated things we did in, uh, in terms of modeling. Uh, from a given subject, volunteer, uh, from many points of view, you will see why this volunteer went through CT, MRI, AOS imaging, which is kind of, of low dose radiation imaging techniques. And then uh, for this uh, volunteer, we model uh, and get from those data, uh, of course, all the bones put in contact and we by hand localize all the insertion points of all the ligaments and we put more than 200 ligaments that allows all those um, uh, bony segments to interact the one with the other one. So this was developed on the open uh, source artisan uh, platform. Uh, so just by looking at the, at the bone, bony structure itself, so without, without any soft tissue, you can see here that uh, by inserting some, uh, some muscle, we are able just, uh, this is real time, uh, able to move the bony structure with the constraint by ligaments and just contact between uh, any uh, uh, bony structure. And then around this, uh, we had to put all the soft tissues, uh, which I show here. With the same ID, uh, one single layer for the skin, fat, muscles, uh, the heel fat pad, and um, so all, all these funny element mesh were connected to the bony structure uh, to, uh, to design the, 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 the complete foot model that you can see here uh, for a simulation of a, of, a, of a gate, of a small uh, foot put in into the contact uh, with the heel and then on the pressure. And you can see here the result of the simulation, the, what we call the bar, uh, pedobiographic uh, 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 print of this model when we simulate a, a platform here. So this is what we simulated with the model, and of course uh, we had to, as any model, had to validate it. So we validated it in a different uh, framework. 
The first we validate by just asking the subject to stay in an upright position without moving, uh, registering uh, the pressure and comparing this pressure with the model simulation and uh, registering the, the pressure for, for many variations of the subject because you do not have a single pressure. Just checking that the value uh, we got in terms of pressure was, uh, I mean, in the range of what was measuring from, for that uh, subject. This was a kind of static validation, and then uh, we wanted to, to, to uh, carry out a dynamic uh, validation of this uh, dynamic uh, foot model that can be deformed by muscle activation. So we had to measure muscle activities uh, on the subject. So as I told you, he was a volunteer for that. Uh, so you can see here uh, this kind of measurement we did on surface, but also uh, hooked uh, electrode uh, that measure EMG. Uh, and uh, during gait with, uh, with kinematic, uh, classical uh, kinematic data uh, uh, during gait or during any uh, abduction, abduction motion of the, of, the, of the foot. So this was the idea. Uh, and thanks to those uh, EMG signal, uh, we uh, were able to, act to activate the corresponding muscle, assuming that EMG is activation, which is not exactly the case, but anyway. Uh, and then uh, with the idea of trying to compare the, uh, actually what was measured in terms of kinematic with uh, what was then uh, uh, simulated by the muscle, uh, by the foot model, uh, putting as input the ENG signal that were recorded on, on, the, on, the, on the volunteer. Again, I won't go into the detail, but uh, we, uh, for given movement, we were able to, of course there are, there are difference, but we are not so bad. Uh, I can go into the detail in terms of comparison from a kinematic point of view, which is much more complicated because, uh, as you probably know, kinematic is, involves many muscles, in, including the very small uh, muscle. And of course, finally, uh, we uh, are still uh, plan to use a foot model for a given pressure recorded by the SOC uh, to estimate uh, internal strength and then risk for, for, for pressure ulcer. So uh, as, you, as you can see, uh, this was done for one volunteer, one subject. Again, we need to find something that is uh, passion specific. So we had the same uh, philosophy as I showed before with this uh, mesh matching and, and repair because sometimes the uh, mesh has to be repaired because of quality of the elements. We were able to, uh, to have a passion specific, this is for three patients, foot model, uh, passing from, from a model that took six years to be designed to a model adapt to the new geometry uh, of, of the patient through direct uh, morphing. Uh, that can be just, so here you have two patients uh, that can be uh, just focus on the bones uh, with instability, but as soon as we put uh, soft tissue, we can uh, run those uh, patient specific model uh, uh, using the same muscle activation property. I will finish uh, my talk with uh, the last example which is uh, probably the most common uh, location of pressure ulcer, which is on the heel for, for lying people also uh, with huge, huge consequence. Just to show you the, the importance of modeling in that case. Uh, so coming back to this question of the heel pressure ulcer, again, we extended the modeling uh, of the foot to the lower leg. And uh, we were there in that case, able to model the interaction between uh, the heel uh, uh, part, the external part of the heel, with uh, soft tissue like, like a mattress. Uh, and to be able to compute, in that case, uh, for this kind of, of deformation, the, the internal strains, and to see again, same message, if those strains are, are higher than 50%. The nice thing I wanted to show you is that thanks to modeling, we can do whatever we want. We can decide. We, we say, okay, what happens if we just take this bone out of this patient and put a new bone coming from another patient? So just change nothing except the shape of this bone. So we did it for, uh, for 18 uh, patients. We just collect, the, this bone is named the calcaneus bone, calcaneus bone of, of those patients. And we just took another, another bone, and which is funny to my point of view, is that you can show that, that two examples, but for one patient, uh, you can get uh, a strain higher than 50%, and for the other one, not. Just because of the change in terms of, of the curvature of the bone, you can get risk for one patient and, we, and no risk for another patient. So again, same message. This is patient specific and, and, and you need the model to do, to do that. Okay, uh, I think I should stop actually. So I, I will, I, I will uh, 
I will skip everything. Uh, so uh, other application uh, for the foot, but I won't, uh, I won't have time to go into the details. I would just, um, yeah, maybe just say, see that uh, I saw that, I know that you did also some work on, on foot modeling with the entire orthotics design. Uh, uh, we also think it's important to, to, to use the model to try to design orthotics and that can also help the people in that sense. Um, in terms of, of uh, perspective, I just wanted to say that uh, we now plan to extend uh, the thing with, in terms of modeling to the, to the knee. We have uh, a PhD student working on knee modeling on all the ligaments. And we also uh, have a PhD starting on modeling spine because we, we are convinced that all those musculoskeletal structures are linked together. And if we want to study the foot, we need also to know what happens on the, on the spine part. Everything is, is connected. OK, I'd like to, to acknowledge all the uh, PhD and colleagues in terms of clinicians and, and scientists who work uh, with some of the work I did present here. And I'm open to for discussions. Question. Thanks. Merci. <laughs> You're welcome. Do we have any um, questions for you, Jeff? Um, yeah, I have a question about the, the surrogate model that you have of the, uh, of the buttocks, the real-time model. Yeah. Um, so did you adjust the geometry? Was that sort of scaled for the person sitting in the, in the pressure pad, or was it a generic geometry? So the example I show you was, again, for one, uh, one volunteer who went through MRI, uh, a scanner and we did all the measurement and uh, he was sitting on a pressure mat so it was only for one su one subject then uh, as you ask a question uh, again uh, this raises the question of uh, what doing in a, and we still do not have the question uh, response to that what doing in a re clinical routine because uh, uh, contrary to uh, uh, some uh, maxillofacial case for which patient go and have MRI uh, scanner uh, imaging we cannot plan to have all the diabetic patients to go into MRI or CT scan and send. So still the question is raised, should we use some more statistical uh, information or some uh, ultrasound, simple imaging modality, and, and you are, in that case, we will have to scale the, the models to, to adapt to patients. Yeah. I have two questions. Sure. Uh, one is that how you validate for internal strain, so that you validate your model with external strain. Do you have any idea about internal uh, that's strain? That's a good question. Uh, uh, unfortunately, as you probably know, there are a few modality, imaging modality modalities that can be used. Uh, we could, we could uh, actually uh, use the, the TAG MRI uh, to do that. I mean, that will need to have a TAG MRI that allows subject to be in a sitting position inside the MRI. I don't know whether it exists or not. Uh, but yeah, that could be one way to try to validate, assuming that uh, the accuracy of TAG MRI is sufficient because you can have, we call those uh, region clusters, cluster or high strain that can be uh, some millimeter cubes, uh, so very small, and, and this is sufficient to create a, uh, an injury. So we need to track that. So I'm not sure the uh, accuracy of TAG MRI is, is uh, of the same order, but that could be one solution, otherwise, uh, I don't know. And one, one challenge with tagged MRI is you need to have repeatable motion as well. So also, tagging is yeah. taking the motion. Presumably you need to get them yeah, to absolutely. stand up and sit down exactly yeah. the same way yeah. through many cycles. I guess. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And the second question I have is about um, finding uh, stiffness of skin. You said that you shifted from indentation to suction. Yeah. What was the reason for that? Actually, um, it was funny because for that, we, we it was almost 10 years ago, we. Uh, we had a, we 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 bought uh, we 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 built a collaboration with MIT at that time, and there was a guy called uh, uh, Mark uh, Otten, Ottenmeyer who designed a kind of portable indentor with this idea. Uh, he designed this to be uh, able to be inserted into a choker, for example, to indent the liver of many other organs. And, uh, and naively, uh, we thought we could use it in the same way. And actually, uh, we discovered that we could have think at it before we are, we are stupid, uh, uh, that, that uh, we could not control uh, all the natural movement of the, of the, of the tissue. Of the, of the, uh, as soon as you, you, you use this indoctor on, on ex, ex vivo tissues, there's no problem because they don't move. But human body moving, you, you have the, all the natural movement like, like due to breathing, but also on the unnatural movement. And you are looking at, at, at some tens of millimeters. And movement are much higher than that. So, we, we, we lost constantly the reference in terms of what, what we didn't measure. This is why with suction, 
you, you are supposed to, to be uh, attached to the, to the reference that can move, but uh, without any, uh, with less, uh, less difference in that case. This was the idea. Just to let you know that the, what I showed you is a, is a quite old version. We moved to a much simpler version of the instruction because we still have to face a kind of uh, sterilization uh, issues and to be able to, to design uh, quite uh, 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 lighter devices. So we, we did something much lighter than, than, than this. But the, again, sorry, uh, um, this is only a kind of local measure that that doesn't uh, really correspond to the activity, uh, constitutive law. I mean, yeah. Paul know, knows uh, this, this much more than me. But our idea was, are we able at least to see difference in terms of stiffness, for yeah. relative difference? So that's, yeah. that's all. Yeah, that's coming, yeah. uh, with respect to ulceration, I imagine there's information, uh, pardon me, uh, using temperature as a biomarker. Sure. Although I would guess that it might be too late. No, you are absolutely right. What, what people call microclimate, actually. So microclimate, the temperature, humidity, the different kind of local information. Uh, so uh, we actually uh, collaborate with a uh, uh, lab in Southampton, University of Southampton, with Dan Bader, who, who has designed some smart sensor able to measure uh, uh, this kind of, of, of uh, in an embedded way, uh, humidity, temperature, and, and also level of oxygenation. There are also some sensors that could be able to be relevant to that. Uh, that's all, all other sources of, of ulceration, you're right, yeah. But, but to, to any way, probably one order of magnitude uh, less important than pressure, because the main origin is pressure, definitely. So um, having different tissues and uh, taking their mechanical properties into account is all very well, but the different tissues also have different injury responses. Um, how do you correlate the uh, um, uh, the the res you know the resulting oh, sorry the pressures and uh, deformations to the resulting injuries for the different tissues? Good question. I don't know. I don't know. Um, and that's a good point. For example, what I said about um, uh, strain, high strain that can lead to injuries, it, it has mainly been shown on fatty tissues. Oh, no, sorry, on muscle tissues. Uh, and it is still, uh, the question is still uh, raised as concerned uh, fatty tissues. Mm -hmm. People guess that we have the same kind of phenomenon. We don't know whether it is the same threshold of 50%. So uh, many questions uh, regarding this, uh, this issue, sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I have another question sure. about the, the model with the pressure sensor, the, the Buttock uh, Epi model. Um, so you used a Neohookian constitutive model uh, mm -hmm. for that, which is um, quite simple. Yeah. And so, um, I guess my question is, um, what do you, do you think that's a complex enough constitutive model for what you're trying to, to model? Do you feel like uh, you need to go to a more sophisticated one, or are you capturing the behavior that you need to with that model? No, no, definitely it's, it's, it's not, it's not uh, the, 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 the constitutive equation we should take at the end. As I told you, we, we have started to move on against uh, modeling because we de definitely do not want to have this kind of softening effect we can have on neuroquian materials. Uh, but to me, still, the question is arise. The idea with this was just start to try to explore this question of reduced order modeling. So uh, all we did with this neuroquian, we, can, we could do it again with another constitutive equation. Uh, to me, that should, should be okay. Uh, but the question is still raised. I mean, uh, we need to have uh, other input from people who are specialists in terms of estimation of the constitution of this kind of tissue, which we are not. Yeah. And it's about getting the data with which to parameterize the more complicated models right. as well. And yeah. Can you justify it based upon yeah. the data that you have access to? Yeah. 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 Any final questions before we say thank you very much? No? Well, we'll let everyone go. Thank you very much for coming. And thank, thank you. you, Johan, for your time. Thanks. And, and